It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It's Jill on Money. This is the program that attempts to take the mystery out of your financial life. And the way that we do that, it's simple. We ask that you send us your financial questions. You can do that on our website, jillonmoney.com. And on the right-hand corner, upper right-hand corner, there's a cool little contact us button. Click that button and you will miraculously be brought to us. So easy. And if you'd like to come on the air and join us, you just click the box and Mark will arrange for everything else. And we love having you guys on the air, just able to uncover and reveal more about what's going on in your financial lives. And I think that always makes all of us a little bit more informed. You too, right? If you're the person with the question and maybe sometimes you forget to give us all the details or maybe there's a detail that you think is not a big deal, but we do. Anyway, today we are starting the program with Matthew in Pennsylvania. Hi, Matthew. How can we help you out? Hey, I just got a couple of questions for you um, okay. about my wife and I, kind of what our background is. And uh, we think we've done a pretty good job uh, saving up over this whole time. We're not really part of the fire movement. We didn't even really know what that was. But, you know, kind of as time goes along, we, we think we're maybe we were doing that. Um, not that we look to retire or anything like that. But now that we've amassed uh, some amount of wealth, just kind of wondering about uh, maybe a little bit about financial anxiety. So and just kind of questioning, you know, when is it OK to throttle back on the savings rate and uh, anything else we should be doing? Okay. The fact that you're like, we're great savers, but I have financial anxiety. Tell me more. So first of all, how old are you, Matthew? Uh, I'm 46. Okay. And wife? Uh, She's 50. And you guys both work? Yes. Uh, How much do you earn together? Uh, Probably 500 a year. Wow. That's great. Fantastic. Do you have some kids? Yeah, we have three kids. How old? Uh, Between the ages of 10 and 17. Um, Are you both maxing out your retirement accounts? Uh, Yes, we both do that. uh, And right, wrong, or indifferent, uh, we both do the Roth in the uh, 401ks. And I even have the opportunity to do the uh, quote unquote mega backdoor Roth uh, within my 401k. And then outside of that, we do the, uh, I guess you'd call the traditional uh, to backdoor Roth on the, I guess, on the brokerage side too. So, you know, 6,000, 7,000 respectively. Great. So we kind of throttle that all in there. And uh, you're saving a ton of money. That's great. We we try our best. Um, How much money is in? Let's just do um, the retirement accounts in general. About how much money have you accumulated? Yeah, I'll look, uh, ignoring all the chaos over the past month, um, maybe 3.3 as of a month ago or so. uh, Wow. Awesome. Okay. That's fantastic. How about non-retirement accounts? What you got? Sure. Brokerage accounts, probably uh, 900000 Okay. Are you guys using individual stocks, mutual funds, index funds? What do you, What's the mix generally? Yeah, yeah. I think on the brokerage side, uh, I learned a little bit over time, but we basically do ETFs um, mm-hmm. like VTI or something like that. Probably have some mutual funds in there now. Uh, probably just trying to figure out how to actually sell those, be, you know, maybe convert over just because we end up paying taxes on those at a pretty high rate right now. Mm. But for now, uh, I guess we have mutual funds and I say maybe half of it's mutual funds and half of it's in an ETF. Okay, great. The kids, have you saved money for college? Yeah, it's probably a, a big life goal for us. So maybe maybe we run the risk of oversaving, but we probably have uh, across the three of them, maybe seven hundred to 750000 You know, our hopes would be they'd go to professional schools or something like that. Um, so Hold we on like- a second. Hold on. Where is the seven fifty held? In 529s or all over the place? Or 529. Yeah, 529s. Stop putting money in there, dude. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. I mean, do you want to go back to school? Because I think you're going to have actually, so you're presuming, I guess what you're presuming is you've got three kids. You want private university, right? Correct. Correct. Because you're a snob. Okay. Yeah, fine. No. <laughs> oh, totally. Penn State's not good enough for you. I get yeah. it. And you're counting on three private university educations as well as three graduate schools? Is that kind of where you're going in your head? Yeah, that's right. So we're probably in that mode. And, and, you know, probably what we'll do is we'll probably throttle back once our oldest tips his toes into the college scene and we figure out what that is. And then we'll adjust or stop or whatever the case may be. I think, can't you stop now? I feel like that you don't need to put more money in there. 
Uh, it's something we can look at. Yeah, if you think that. I, I mean, right. Mark, do you think that we need to keep putting money? He's got three quarters of a million dollars in five twenty nine plans, and the kids are ten to seventeen. If he wants three private educations and grad school, I actually do think he needs to keep contributing. Really? Yeah, I just my my frame of reference there is, uh, you know, I think I exited uh, university with a hundred thousand dollars in loans, and I think my brother, uh, sisters, ex- et cetera, exited the universities and uh, professional schools with four hundred thousand dollars of loans each. Uh, so. All right, all right. So, how much longer? How what does he have to get to, Mark? A million? What does he have to get to to do three privates and three grad schools? I guess it depends the grad school, right? Because honestly, you could do medical school, but you might have someone who's like in a one year master's program. So. That's why I was thinking that maybe seven fifty would be enough. I mean, I, I would think minimum three hundred per child. <laughs> okay, so all right, kind of a target. Yep. Okay, so um, and how much are you contributing to the five twenty nine on an ongoing basis? Do you put a certain amount in, or do you use bonus money? How do you do it? Yeah, we just do it every other week, kind of thing with the pay. Okay, in the non qualified account, I presume that all of that money is probably has a low cost basis. Is that right? Yes, probably uh, maybe half of it is at a, you know, maybe 450 is cost basis and 450 is earnings, you know, over all that time. So it's not really worth it for you to, I mean, are you going to actually sell the dividend producing mutual fund? No, yeah, I would I would not do that. That was kind of those things, you know, I picked my head up 20 years later and uh, you wonder, oh my, I have, a, an issue, I have an issue here called, the, right. you know, the government. Right. So at this point, if you talk about the, the savings and the throttling back, like, are you living a life? Are you happy? Are you living like paupers? Like what you're saving a ton of money. Are you feeling financial anxiety that's self-imposed? That's what I'm trying to get to underneath this. Yeah, I think it's probably self-imposed to some extent, just for considering our backgrounds and things like that. But, you know, for the most part, we live the life that, you know, we're not, uh, we're definitely not on this fire movement. That's why I said that earlier on, where folks, you know, really scrimp and save and do all these things. We kind of, if we want something, we go get it. Um, yeah. You know, we buy new vehicles. We do, in fact, drive them for eight or nine years. Um you know, if we want to go on a family trip, we do that. Uh, You know, we do send them to private schools now. So it's kind of like, you know, how do I want to say it? Uh, You know, raising three kids, we don't, couldn't even spend the money necessarily if we wanted to, unless we started to do things that, you know, most people wouldn't recommend, you know, just going buying fancy cars or fancy boats or something for no particular reason. Right. So I would say, I I guess we're content and we're just kind of questioning in that content zone, you know, what's the appropriate time to start thinking about this savings rate a little bit differently? Or do we, you know, I think one of the more difficult questions is, well, we put a lot of money into our Roth because that's something that's uh, Roth 401k, that quote unquote mega backdoor Roth. That's something that's only been opened up to us recently. You know, we feel like that's too good of an opportunity to pass up. So we end up saving a lot because it's, it's a possibility to do so. But maybe if that option wasn't even presented to us, maybe we wouldn't be doing that necessarily. How much do you pay in private school tuition right now? I would say 30000 30, a year. And that's for the three of them? Yeah. We'll get back to Matthew in just a second. During the break, hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. And there, why not sign up for the free weekly newsletter? It's free. I'm not making a big ask, okay? You get it every Friday. Check it out. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. This is the show that takes the mystery out of your financial life. And we do that by helping you make the next best financial decision. And we invite you to come on the air with us. And that way, you can join us in the Capital One Bank Virtual Studios. Capital One, this is banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Right now, let's get back to our listener, Matthew, to find out how we can relieve his financial anxiety. If you like look at your actual 
expected need, meaning like not saving or anything, but what you really think you need to live on to live like a lovely life, not not a, you know, you're not living like paupers, like you're living the life you want to live in retirement. What is what do you think that that is? What do you think the the monthly nut would be? Yeah, maybe maybe ten ten thousand dollars a month, but you know, at our age, I don't know that we can accurately even forecast that. But we try to look at what we spend today, mm-hmm. and to some extent, when our kiddos go to uh, college, we would think that to some extent, if that's all funded by their TAP five twenty nines, we'd actually be seeing you know a little bit more cash flow because we wouldn't be paying for their high school or middle school education. Um, so we kind of feel like in a year or two, we'd get more cash flow coming up. So I, f- I feel like maybe ten thousand bucks a month kind of thing. Okay. And do either of you have jobs where you would get pensions or are you just social security kind of people? Ooh, yeah, we would uh, We would both have a pension, about roughly say 4000 a month. 4000 each? Correct. Yeah. You're, so you mean of your $10,000 a month need, you will have $8,000. I'm, I'm like incredulous. Stop saving so much money for God's sakes. Um, <laughs> you have $8,000 a month in pensions and that doesn't even include any social security benefit, right? That's right. Mark, I don't even know what to say. I mean, we're going to get hate mail for sure. Okay, I get it. The mega backdoor Roth, it's too good to be true. You're maxing out your retirement. But like, I almost feel like you don't even, you could just pull back on retirement right now. Is that right? Yeah. Because, I mean, look, what do, there's no, is there any money that is in traditional retirement funds? Uh, you, you mean like a like a traditional four hundred one k? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, oh no, yeah, probably uh, two two and a half million of that is in a traditional account. I get that you love your your saving. You're doing a great job. You don't have to save as much as you're saving. Your okay. retirement need is essentially met. You might have to spend a few bucks because you might say, I mean, I don't know when you're going to retire. You got kids, and the youngest one is the youngest one is not going to really be done for another ten years. You, I, do you plan on working for ten years? Like, what do, what's your game plan right now? Yeah, our game plan isn't to necessarily uh, to stop working. I mean, we we enjoy it and all that, but you know, maybe in uh, ten years, pick up our heads and decide maybe quote unquote retire early at that point. Yeah. I mean, and then guess what? At that time, you get these pensions and then you have a few years where you spend down some of your non-qualified money to, to live and, you know, have some fun. And and then when Social Security kicks in, you're you're essentially done and you'll have, you know, multiple mid millions. You probably are going to have end up having three, four, you know, you're going to have $10 million when you retire. It's going to be like kind of not a big deal to get that much money. And doesn't that sound crazy? But you're there. Like you got four and a half now and, you know, that's all going to happen. I think that you can stop putting as much money into okay. retirement right now. And then if you want to juice up your 529 plans, but I mean, really don't go crazy with that either because you have cash flow. You can pay for some of this and you can have, you should be feeling proud of yourselves, not anxious about where you are. It's like, you're so good at this. You have to like get out of the cycle. This reminds me of like when I was doing Weight Watchers when I was in college. So I was a college athlete and I stopped playing. I got injured and then I gained a ton of weight and I went to Weight Watchers. All right. And I couldn't stop dieting once I lost all the weight because I was so fearful. Like, oh, what if I gain it back? So I was a very good dieter, but I couldn't figure out how to maintain a weight that was normal. And so like, I lost so much weight. I like, it looked terrible. I looked awful. Okay. But that's kind of where you are. You've done like the extreme saving, but you don't know how to like pull back a little bit. Here's your permission. You can pull back. Mark, what do you, what do you want them to stop doing? The mega backdoor Roth, the backdoor Roth? Like, where do you want them to like pull back? I would probably keep doing the mega because, you know, if they ever get their act together with Build Back Better, that's for sure going away. So I, I would probably take advantage of that while it's around. But, I, you know, but I don't see a need to do a backdoor Roth at this point. Absolutely not. I think just you can skip the backdoor Roth. You can put more money in the non-qualified account, in the non-retirement account and add some ETFs. You can um, build that up. How much is your house worth, by the way? Uh, I'd say just under 300 And you have a mortgage outstanding? No. You had to ask that question? I know. I just, I had to, but I'm just laughing at myself that I did. You are in such good financial shape. You need to, I like the idea that the subject line of your email was financial anxiety. And it was funny. Then you wrote message help. Not really, but somewhat. So, (laughs) I mean, but I get what you're saying. Like, it's hard to kind of stop yourself from doing this thing. 
called saving and and you know you're you're doing it and you're good at it and like you said you're living a de- you're living a life that you'd like to live like all that is good but you now need to just breathe a little bit and appreciate all the hard work that you've done and let yourselves just relax into this really because there's no reason that i can see that you need to be like going crazy here I, sure. I and I real and even to I I'm going to stick to my original premise, which is I don't even think you need more in the 529, but it doesn't matter because even if you put it in and you pay the penalty later, it doesn't really matter. I, I just would like enjoy yourself, have fun, take nicer vacation. Don't you don't have to get a fancy car because I think that's dumb. Also, <laughs> what, what's the thing that you're not doing that you wish you could be doing? Um, yeah, I, I think the maybe the only thing that I can't quite figure out. Uh, Maybe in a couple of years, uh, we'll, we'll look to do some a little bit more traveling, amp that up a little bit. But I think the one thing that I struggle just from like planning all this stuff, because it's so much in our DNA, we really struggle finding somebody on the back end of it to really help us with the decumulation and trying to figure out the plans for that. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe we want to, in retirement, buy another home or something like that. What's the best approach uh, to kind of extract that money? And since we can't really see how that part works, tax implications and other things like that, that's maybe partly why we're kind of stuck trying to figure this out, you know, when we can throttle back a little bit. Because part of our goal would be to take a good chunk of the money once we do hit retirement, you know, and, and spend quite a bit of it uh, kind of right out of the gate with a second home or something like that. Well, I mean, look, even if that were the case, and, and, and we can get you there. And if you want, you can you can hire a fee-only financial planner who will just do a plan for you. Like, you don't want anyone who's going to be a money manager right this second. You just don't because they're going to grab onto your money. Right. They're going to be like, I want to manage it. And you're going to pay a lot of fees. But there's plenty of people who will do a standalone financial plan for you, for sure. And just do that plan and build that plan for you. You know what, um, Mark, let's send Matthew the contact information for our our CFP friend in New Jersey. She does just straight up planning. She'll charge you real money. Like it'll be five or 10 grand to do a plan. But you mm-hmm. tell her, this is what I want. I want to spend 10 grand so you can give me peace in mind. Like, wouldn't you pay someone 10 grand to get, reduce that financial anxiety? Like you're just talking to me and I'm telling you this, but she'll prove it to you. Sure. And you can say to her, I want you to build in the fact that we're going to buy uh, I'm going to make it up, uh, you know, a, a $500,000 house in the mountains. Um, and that's what we want. And like you build it out. And the decumulation is kind of an interesting question. It's very difficult, by the way. It's the it's actually the hardest thing for most people to adjust to beyond like just I have too much time on my hands. But in terms of retirement, you're very good at accumulating. It's hard to take money out. And for you guys, all that would mean is to try to sort of show you that you don't even have to take that much out because this pension is going to be enough. So if you, if I said to you, well, you know what, I could sort of like stand on my head and spin a plate on my foot and show you how to get five grand a month out of your accounts and not worry, you, you can't, you couldn't screw it up enough to blow up your plan. You cannot, okay. you cannot. Okay. You and your wife are doing an awesome job. Do you guys have wills? I've, you've got to have wills. Uh, yeah, we have that uh, stuff set up, so we should be all, all a okay there. Okay, we'll get back to the Jill on Money show in just a second. During the break, go to the website, jillonmoney.com, and just bookmark it, because you never know when you might have a financial question. Okay, we'll be right back to answer more of your financial questions. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are talking to you about your financial issues. And we don't really care what those issues are. They can be about financial anxiety, even if you're pretty much in great shape. They can be about your anxiety over potentially 
trying to figure out how to pay for your kid's college education. Maybe it's anxiety over a job. Whatever it is, we'd love to hear from you. The way that we would encourage you to ask your questions, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com. Click contact us. We'll get your note. Right now, we're going to talk to Steve from Pennsylvania. But it seems to me that you live basically all over the Northeast, right, Steve? That was my job for uh, 30 years. I was the Northeast regional guy. So I, it's my territory. I love it. Did you, um, did you drive or did you use like Amtrak? Well, I drove mostly once in a while. I would fly for the outer limits, like, you know, the Southern tier in New York or down to Atlantic City or Maryland, that kind of stuff. All right. And now you said that was what you did. Are you no longer doing that? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm like seven days into my, uh, I, I've, I've stayed away from the R word for all the ageism and other reasons. I'm on my sabbatical after a 47 year work career. I'm taking a sabbatical. <laughs> I love that idea. So seven days into, wait, how old are you, Steve? I just turned 66 on Sunday. Okay. So you're seven days into your 30 year sabbatical. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I, my encore sabbatical. <laughs> I like that. That's so good. How did you make the decision to finally be done? Were you Did you like have enough money or were you just kind of done because you felt like, all right, I need to move on? What, what was it that prompted you to actually step down from the work, the work wheel? This was news to me when I had to file for Medicare. So I'm, I'm really a Johnny come lately to this. I obviously was saving I did the Medicare thing. And then last year, my wife had a serious health problem. She lost a kidney. <gasps> um, and it was, um, we like to think, you know, we love the medical profession. I'm a very high-minded person. People work hard to do their job well. But with COVID, they just missed the diagnosis. And oh. uh, she ended up losing a kidney. And once she lost the kidney and we realized how precious health is, signing up for Medicare triggered my further work with financial planners. And that gave me the green light, but I said, I still wanted to work. Then we get hit with the healthcare issue. Oh so, my God. So. Now, is she doing okay now? Oh yeah. She's uh, chipper and uh, recovered and it's just how precious time is. <laughs> you know, what's so weird is that, you know, I think that there's so many people who came out of COVID with that kind of questioning. But it, this, of course, could have happened at any time, right? You could have a serious health issue that causes you to reconsider what you do next. And, you know, out of that very difficult time, uh, you make different choices. So tell us a little bit about how you were able to afford to do this. Like what was going on financially for you that allowed you to take the step out of the uh, work life? Again, I'm not good at this. I was a legislative regulatory affairs guy. I was really focused on my career. I just went to work every day and saved. We had the 401k at work. And that's why I'm calling it because, you know, even though I've sort of like been a cat falling on my feet, our feet, um, there's still one or two issues that are, you know, I think seriously weak. Um, the financial planner that we hired, the independent, uh, what's that word you guys use? Fiduciary. Fiduciary, you know, she was very good. She set us on the path. She really clobbered me over the head about getting a budget, which we never really had. Mm -hmm. Shame on us. And when that happened, we realized we could go, but I still was hanging in there saying, I'd like to keep working. I sort of liked what I did, but then this other stuff happened you know, I, I worked for an industry with a lot of um, issues when you look at climate change and global warming and um, environmental concerns, social justice and stuff. And and I like to think we did a really great job and we're doing a really great job. But um, there are a lot of people who think we have some serious demerits. <laughs> OK, well, um, I'm not going to ask about that, but I'm going to ask you how much money is in the 401k? Well, you know, right now we did the rollover to Vanguard to mm -hmm. one of the major threes, and there's about a little over two million. The last I looked, I think I'm down some. With there's, there's okay. two million in there. Okay. And do both you and your wife receive Social Security yet? No, that was one of the questions I had for you because right now I, I sort of have this like um, nest egg syndrome, mm -hmm. and I don't really want to spend much of it. So maybe I should go on. You know, my full retirement age will be in July or August, sixty six and four months, right? Okay. So the debate is whether to draw down or not. My wife will be eligible with her 66 and six months next August. She's a year younger than I am. That was part of the issue is do I delay taking social security and draw down? You know, a year ago, I would have been more amenable to that. But with what's happening in the market, you know, they say don't time the market, but 
isn't this really about market timing? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll talk about that in a second. Do you have money outside of your retirement account, yeah, outside of that $2 million? That's the problem, I think. Uh, we, we own our home, which is close to a 680. We just had an appraisal done on it, $680,000. Uh, short money on that, $75,000 outstanding and no real cash. That was, that's the, the, the message I, the memo I didn't get was I was saving. I said, I don't need cash. I have Mm -hmm. all this money in the market. Mm -hmm. And now I realize that I need cash. (laughs) Yeah, right. So how are you living right now? I mean, what are you living on? Well, you know, I just got my last paycheck. And um, uh, the the, uh, first drawdown is going to come. My mailbox money or whatever it's called is going to show up uh, next week. My first uh, monthly check. And we did the budget. I need about $120,000 a year, $10,000 a month. Tell me what the social security benefit will be. Mine will be about 3200 and my wife's will be about 1600 And so there's no other money. So there's that 4800 that's due to come in. You need 10000 a month. There's no other outside investments. There's no rental property or anything like that, right? No, we, we stashed a little bit away, maybe $75,000 in a, in a Schwab IRA. Again, I didn't do the Roth. I took the tax advantage because mm-hmm. I was in that bracket. Mm-hmm. The other one is years ago when her father died, we hired a financial planner and we have this uh, annuity, uh, variable rate annuity. They mm. have that money, our money for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And it's it's in a payout stage now. We're getting about $10,000 a month, a, a year from that, rather. Oh, too bad. With month, I was very excited. <laughs> I like it less now, but, it's, but you're getting it. So that's yeah. fine. Okay. We'll get back to Steve's question in just a minute. During the break, you know what you're going to do. You're going to go to JillOnMoney.com and you're going to click that contact button to ask us your financial question. We'll be right back. 401ks, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. You're back. It's Jill on Money, and this is the program that does try to take the mystery out of your financial life. And, you know, we always do direct you to the website, not just for the contact button, because that's how we find out what your questions are, but we also have a ton of great content that lives on that website. So we have this radio show, but we also have two different podcasts. Our first podcast is called Jill on Money. That's the OG podcast that we've been doing for a while. That comes out every single day, but it's a little bite size, like 10, 12 minutes. Very easy to absorb. And then we also have our Eye on Money podcast, which comes out twice a week. You know what the big benefit of the Eye on Money podcast is? Mark is the co-host. I mean, that is a huge payoff. So I encourage you to check out both of those podcasts. We have links so that you can follow us, subscribe to us wherever you get podcasts. But if you don't know how to do that, we'll show you. It's very easy. We also have um, some other neat stuff on the website. And I would point out the resources section because that's an area where I think we learn a lot from you. So if you've got an idea about some financial resource that you have been using that's been helpful to you, you should definitely let us know. Share it with your Jill on Money community because that is going to be one of those things that, you know, we just can't keep track of every single great website or calculator out there. So if you find something, do let us know. Okay, now let's get back to Steve from Pennsylvania. So I don't see how you don't file for Social Security in July. I think you're going to have to because I think you need cash flow. You don't want to have that money come all out of your IRA rollover. So what you're going to need to do is now that that money is in the rollover account, we need to start to figure out a strategy to get you the money you need to live on, right? So you got this 2 million bucks and um, and you need 10,000 a month. So you're going to have to free up whatever money you think you're going to need in the next, I'm going to say year, because who knows what's going to happen with the markets. It's be, you know, it's going to be seesaw. So at this point, you're going to have to take that money out of the retirement account and you're going to have to pay tax on it. That's okay. I mean, you don't really have that much income. You probably got some, you'll have some more income this year because you, you got paid for the first, whatever, three months of the year, then you'll get your social security to make up the difference, you're going to have to take out whatever. You're going to have to sell some stuff and take the money out that you're going to need. Maybe you're going to have to sell, 
let's say 150 grand or so, so that you then have the money to be able, you're going to have to like kind of stash some money away. And by the way, when you have your social security, you can't just spend all that money. You're going to need to build up a little bit of a cushion for yourselves so that you're going to, number one, have to pay taxes next year, right? And number two, you just need a little cushion because things happen, as you know. But I think that that's going to be the game plan. I think you're going to have to use your 401k and pull the money out slowly but surely and let that finance you until you get to next summer. And the the amount you pull out of the 401k will go down because once your wife collects her social security benefit and you've got this $4,800, then we need to get you, you know, another, let's call it 60 grand or so, right? From the 401k every year. That's what you need. That's kind of like you're on track to be able to hit that. The only other thing that I would say is, is there any idea around this house that you're going to stay in it, leave? What else? Any any plans to move? Any other real estate? No, no plans to move. We, we plan to age in place. We, our children are in Philadelphia and outside of Boston. Down that path, you know, I, I'm looking. And then one of the reasons I wanted to call, I guess, at the end of the day, you've told me that I 3% out of the portfolio, 3 to 4%. Blended with the Social Security, that's the plan to go there yep. on that. The other piece of that is because we're so cash poor, i looking at my house and I've, I've listened to a lot of stuff, your podcast and others, obviously. And, you know, I, the heck of mortgage came to mind. I don't need the money, but I, I need money in an emergency. You know, yeah, I wouldn't, have, have yeah, but, but, you know, that those work, the reverse mortgage will work better as you get older. And it's always there. You'll have equity in your home. You know when reverse mortgages actually work really well? When you're older and interest rates are higher. So I would wait. It is a good fail safe back of your, you're like, oh my God, if I had to, that's fine. But I wouldn't do that now. What about what about your estate planning? Did you get all that crap done when you got freaked out about your wife? Yeah, we, uh, we actually, uh, we, we're on the path to do it, but it's all done now. We got it done in December. Keep on keeping on. You know, I think it's kind of cool to be in your 30-year sabbatical, and we just want to make sure that you don't run out of money more than anything else. That's my number one concern for you guys, all right? Thank you for uh, uh, putting your hands on this. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. So um, we'll let Steve go. And for those of you listening, you know, it's a weird thing to consider. I got $2 million, sounds like a ton of money. But as you can tell, because of like the the lifestyle they've built, they built it around their working lives. And, you know, we, we have a hard time in retirement or sabbatical to really reduce what we're doing. So that means we really have to adjust our expectations. And sometimes those expectations Expectations can be around, you know, how much I spend. Sometimes those expectations can be around, you know, whether you'd be willing to work or do some part-time stuff, or maybe even just tap the equity in your home later in life. But we want some contingency plans. I like plan B, C, and D. Mark knows this is how I live my life. I always have an operating plan of like, I never count on the best case scenario. I go to the worst case, I plan for that, and then I move back away from that because I don't like to stay in the bad place. I just want to know that If I want to do something, I can do it. Okay, if you would like to join the program, you know what to do. JillOnMoney.com. Hit the Contact Us button and we'll get you on the air. We'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we finish up the hour, how about a little uh, email? Let's do that. Uh, This is from Nick, who is 46 years old and married. And he writes, our annual household income is approximately $110,000. We have about $450,000 in retirement accounts. We put about $20,000 in retirement every year. We've got $400,000 in a savings account and owe $288,000 on a mortgage at 3.25%. 
that mortgage will be paid off in 21 years and the home value is $600,000. Here's the question. Should I make additional payments? Should I invest some of the $400,000? If so, in what? Not sure what I should do with the $400,000. I think I'm being overly cautious by keeping it in a savings account that's paying so little. Thank you for your help. Well, Nick, look, I don't think you should pay off the mortgage. I don't know um, too much more about you in terms of like your goals, but from what you're saying, it probably makes more sense for you to use some of that cash in that savings account to create a brokerage account, a non-retirement brokerage account. In doing so, what you're really trying to do is supplement the saving that you're doing in those retirement accounts. I think that if you were to do that, you would kind of split the difference, which is, you know, you don't have to have so much money in cash, but on the other hand, you don't want to take all that money and lose it and lose the liquidity or access to it by paying off the mortgage. So I would say, figure out what your real comfort level is in cash. I don't know. It's probably not more than $100,000. Then take the rest and start the process of creating a long-term investment portfolio. I know you might be thinking, what's that? Well, what that would be is basically a few index funds. And if you need more help, get back in touch with us. I promise we will help you out. But no, don't pay off the mortgage. Okay, that's it. That's the first hour of Jill on Money. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. the weekend and that can only mean one thing you're listening to jill on money the show that takes the mystery out of your finances here's your host jill schlesinger you're back it's our number two of the jill on money show and we are so delighted that you are here with us we really do appreciate it and we hope that this show has really helped expand the way you think about your financial life. So today in uh, our interview segment, we are going to bring on somebody who has been on the program before. Her name is Bobby Rebel. She's a certified financial planner. She's a journalist and she is also a writer. Bobby's newest book is called Launching Financial Grownups, Live Your Richest Life by Helping Your Almost adult kids become everyday money smart. She has got some really interesting insights as to why parents sometimes, I would say, are a little nosy and put themselves in their kids' financial lives when they shouldn't be. So I think that it's important to try to bring to your your financial situation, your family situation, you kind of have to own what your your part of this is. So what I hope is that you guys get a little bit of a taste of the book. We'll link to it in the show notes. And you, you know, after the program, you can go to jillonmoney.com. You can check it out. But again, it's called Launching Financial Grownups. Bobby is joining us from the Capital One Bank Virtual Studios. Capital One, this is banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Here's the first part of our interview with Bobby Rebel. Why is it so hard for people to launch financial grownups? Why are parents so bad at this? You know, a lot of it is that, especially this generation of parents of these older kids have put so much into our young adults that it's hard for us to let go. Very often, they're okay. They want to launch, but we have been helicopter parents. We've been snowplow parents. And now I like the term concierge parents because it's upping it to a whole new level, Jill, where we still want to solve their problems. We still want to, you know, plow an easy path for them. But now we're going to use money to solve their problems because they've got real grown-up financial things happening and money can often ease the way for them. But we need to start letting go a little bit. Now, do you speak of this from your own experience? Like how did this book come to be? (laughs) 100% my own experiences on two fronts. First of all, what I just said, 
my husband and I found ourselves, you know, using money to instantly solve problems for our kids, sometimes things that they didn't even ask us to solve. So, you know, someone needs to raise money for a school project. It's like if your little kid's raising money for the Girl Scouts and you just buy the boxes that they need to sell, you need to let them sell them. It's the same thing as they get older. You need to let them raise money for their film project, which is something that's happening now with our 22 year old who wants to go into the movie business it would be so much easier for us to just write the check rather than say, well, how are you going to do it? And he came up with the idea that he's going to raise money and he's got his fundraising site and he's marketing that. And then the other thing was that I was having trouble getting them to do things that I knew they should do, like open up a Roth IRA because they both are good kids. They were earning money at young ages in their mid-teens. And they weren't spending it all over the place, but it was just sitting there. And I kept trying to get them to open this Roth IRA and it wasn't happening. And I realized that this was probably something that was happening for a lot of parents where you've got good kids, you know what they need to do, but because they're teenagers or young adults, they're busy or they're not focused. They will tell you they'll do it, but they weren't. So I needed help. And there really wasn't a book for the stage group. And yeah, I love that because like, there's no book. I think I'll write the book. No. That's a great yeah. idea. I'm wondering how you think the pandemic accelerated this trend, because I find that, you know, so many of my friends who have kids who are, you know, young adults and, and adults, their kids came back home and the cycle began again. How do you see that playing out in the post pandemic world? This is such a good question, Jill. Thank you. So it accelerated it, as you said, but there were some upsides. So the sort of negativity here that you allude to is that you had these young adults, these almost adults moving home, not in a financial crisis. This was just what you would call almost a systematic thing that happened. And so they're not moving home, you know, because they're slackers. They're just moving home because, oh my gosh, it's a pandemic, but they've never lived at home as adults. So it's very easy to come home and mom and dad are doing the things that mom and dad always did, like provide meals, like do your laundry. You're in your childhood bedroom. You can regress a lot. And that's what happened sort of at the, you know, the knee jerk moment when the pandemic first happened is you, everyone kind of went back to these patterns from before they left, you know, the nest. But then because it went on and on, things evolved and relationships matured. And a lot of young adult children, because they were in the household, were able to have more mature relationships with their parents and more exposure to their parents' real world financial situations, challenges, and successes. And that opened up all kinds of new discussions in families that was really a blessing. A lot of my friends found themselves also sort of agog at watching their children work in some respects. I'll give you like this great example. One of my best friends, a lovely couple, their daughter had graduated from college right in the beginning of, of COVID and she became a paralegal. She's like, you know, wanted to see whether or not she wanted to go to law school. And, you know, she's working as a paralegal for one of these white shoe New York law firms. And when I tell you that, you know, they worked them like beasts and these firms made money hand over fist during COVID, but she's in their basement. And my friend would call me and she'd say to me, like, the kid is working, like, honestly, till two o'clock in the morning, hours on day. Like, I just think it's bad for her. And I'm like, uh, she'd be doing this anyway. She'd be in an office with other people and you wouldn't be seeing it and worrying about it. But like the fact that you're seeing it, like you're now making her crazy because she would go down and she's like, are you sure you still need to be working? And the kid's like, I'm fine. To that point, I think what's interesting is that you point out that this is also about the parents. You said that. You said like, you know, this is part of what we do as parents, as grandparents, as friends. What are some of the tools or the tips you have for people who do find themselves wading in a little bit too quickly and trying to save their kids or do whatever it is, whether it's money or protect them? How can they stop doing that? The truth is we have to remember that they are the main character in their stories and we are just the supporting players. So we need to support them, but we also need to kind of be in the background when that's where our mark is. So as you point out, I mean, it's almost like when 
they were in college and they might be out, you know, let's say they pull an all nighter because they didn't study in advance or they're just out partying. We're not seeing that. So we're not worrying. But suddenly if they're home and they go out late at night, you know, pre pandemic, obviously, or maybe now, hopefully they're having some fun. When you see it, you're, you're up waiting for your child to come home. So it's this awareness, but we need to take a step back and realize this is a season of their life when they do want to work hard. They do want to establish themselves in their careers, and we need to give them the breathing room. I mean, a lot of parents, it's the same thing when you hear about parents going into the professor, lobbying for their kid to get a higher grade. No, let them get whatever the grade is that's appropriate for them and let them work to get the better grade. It's their life, and we need to be a little bit away. We're not their best friend. We're their parent. We'll get back to Bobby Rebell in just a moment. During the break, maybe you would want to go to JillOnMoney.com and click the Contact Us button because you're having a problem figuring out how to help launch your financial grown-up kit. Or maybe you've got parents who are being a little bit too busy buddy in your life and you need some help pushing them back a little bit. It's true that we have been the arbiter of some family issues in the past. So if that's you, go on the website, jillonmoney.com, click the contact us button. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. Let's get right back into our interview with Bobby Rebell. We're talking about parenting to grownups, but can you talk a little bit about how we start forming the habits if people are lucky or unlucky enough to say have teenagers right now? I've got to, here's another story for you. This happened this morning. Okay. You ready? I only because I have, I'm in a neighborhood group text and here's the text that I got. Hi friends. Um, including my daughter on this text, who's doing a school project. She's like 14 years old. Okay. Doing a school project on politics of climate change. She needs to interview some people who are directly or peripherally involved in the topic. Do you guys know anyone she can interview? Okay. This is a whole long text chain. I was sort of like, why are parents doing this? My sister can sometimes do this also. Like, you know, I want you, you know, do this. And I'm like, but you have to teach your child to ask for this. Can we get parents or grandparents to encourage their children to start asking for these things themselves to learn that lesson? And when should that happen? Because I was sort of like 14. I think she should be asking me herself. What do you think? It's going to depend on the kid and their confidence Mm -hmm. level, but you need to get them there. So my book officially, you know, I talk about it's age 16 and up. So the 14 year old, and I have a 14 year old, by the way, I give a little bit of wiggle room. But for example, with my 14 year old, when he needs to see his extra, his math teacher for extra help, I tell him, you're going to send the email and make the appointment and just CC me. So you're keeping tabs on them, but you're also letting them, you know, start taking the lead. So it's a gradual thing. Every kid is different. In this case, look, 14, as I said, a little bit young still, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. And also these are people, you know, were the child to get on there directly. You don't know this child, presumably directly, and they may not be comfortable texting all of these grownups. Now, maybe instead of that, the parent could have said to the 14 year old, who do you know that you could reach out to? What grownups have you encountered in your life that you're interested in that might work for this project? So I feel like it's okay to say, you know, she knows me. So, you know, whatever. I was at her bat mitzvah, whatever. So I know, I know this kid. But in general, I find you're right. I'll give some leeway to the 14 year old, but even people like this person I went to camp with a hundred years ago and she sends me this whole long email about her kid who's like a journalism major at Northwestern. And could I, you know, talk to her about, you know, potential internships at CBS and da, 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 right? And I was just violently mad about the whole thing because this woman did not attend my father's shiva, never wrote me a note after my father died, but here she is asking me for a favor. And I'm like, I'm not taking it out on the kid. So I say, here is my email address. Have her contact me. She never contacted me. So basically what's happening here is the kid is not ready to do what the the mom is asking. I mean, the kid should have written to you directly. And if the kid isn't ready, she isn't ready. So what I, and that's a frustrating thing. And that happens all the time. The lack of follow-up from the kid, the parents are 
you know, paving the way, doing that snowplow thing. That's a snowplow thing. And, you know, teeing it up for the kid and the kid is not there yet. So if I was her parent, I would have told her, look, I have this friend, Jill, I will give you her email. When you email her, you know, show me the letter, show me, I, I do have kids show me, my kids, my older kids, they show me drafts of letters. Absolutely. They write the draft and I talk to them. I don't sit at the computer and press the keys. I talk to them about it. We put it in a Google doc so we can both mm -hmm. see it if they're not in the same place. And I talk them through it and they have to always press the keys and they send it. And then I maybe, you know, in the case of your friend, maybe I would have sent you a little not text even saying, hey, friend, not even hey. fra. Right. Okay. <laughs> but I would have sent a little text, hey, my daughter's gonna send you a letter. Please look for it. You know, I'd appreciate it if you can respond. But basically, not send that text until that letter goes out, that email goes out, and she can be BCC'd on that email. But the kid is living their life and they are doing it for themselves. And that's really important. Now, we also get a ton of people who write into us and come on the show and they talk about their children and investing. And you have an entire chapter of the book devoted to grown up investing. Now, how can we help these young adults start to manage their own financial lives? You want to give them information, but you don't want to do it for them. So what does that look like when it comes to investing? It looks like telling them that they have to be investing, but not telling them what they need to be investing in. It's giving them information, as you said, but also this is the key thing, not judging, because there's a lot of investments today that you and I are going to say, oh no, oh no, no, no. But what's important at this age, and they have time, you know, time is on their side, is that with at least an appropriate portion of their investments, they do learn what their actual risk tolerance is. I think the most important lesson you can teach your child is to be sort of, you know, sort of the EQ of investing, figure out what their real risk tolerance is, because it's probably lower than they think. And so they might see on Reddit, you know, these stocks are being, you know, blown up during the, you know, we had hurts during the pandemic, that kind of stuff. And everyone's talking about them and, you know, they have to understand, well, okay, you can do that, but understand your information source, understand the risk and understand that that could go bye-bye or it could do really well. A lot of people did make money on it. And that's why I say, don't judge where they're investing. Talk to them about why they chose that investment, what information they based it on, and did they really understand the risk and understand also, there's a great story um, by my friend Jen Barrett, um, who wrote actually the book, Think Like a Breadwinner. And she talks about her teenager who, I hesitate to say it's investing, but he basically flips virtual stuff in the metaverse mm -hmm. and she's mortified. And yet he's making so much money. And so at the end of the day, it's trading. He understands the product probably understands some of the risks to some degree. But again, he's very young. These aren't huge sums of money. And he's getting his feet wet and understanding it. And I think that is important to give them that freedom to understand what risk is comfortable for them and understand principles of investing like dollar cost averaging and diversification and things like that, rather than judge the specific investments. How do you feel about the parents who are also waiting in on career advice? I feel like this is a little bit thorny because, you know, we have our experience of our careers and the workplace has shifted pretty dramatically. But, you know, I think especially I'm often asked by nieces and nephews about negotiation, for example, and it's hard. So how do you manage the, you know, being helpful and, you know, I think you called it like the pep talk in some respects, like, you know, you, like, like you want to be helpful, you want to be supportive, but you don't want to like be the hammer, like, no, don't do it that way. So what are some tips around that? It's a lot thorny, by the way, not just a little. It's so yeah. tricky. I think you want to work back what we've done and what I think worked really well for our oldest, who's now 25. This is my stepdaughter, Ashley, who's featured in the book. With her, she entered college and she was going to be a teacher and she loved teaching. She was always a, a counselor at camps and always so good with children. And she also wanted to live in New York City and she also wanted to own her own apartment at a young age. She had to think hard about that. And she made, and, and we talked to her a lot about that. We talked to her a lot about what, literally, let's look at apartments. Let's work backwards. What do you need for a down payment? What's your ongoing cost going to be? So she saw those numbers for the life she wanted not us. She wanted that. And she made a decision to switch to the school of informatics. And she now works, I'm going to bungle what she does a little bit, but basically she's a cybersecurity analyst for a major firm. And she makes a very good living for a 25 year old. I'm so proud of her. And that really worked backwards from 
the lifestyle that she wanted to lead and not be dependent on us. And I will tell you, on the day that we closed on her apartment, we had to be there because of the co-op rules, but she saved that down payment. She saved the closing costs, which we were very nervous about the closing costs. That mortgage, we see it go through just because of the way it's set up. She pays it to the penny every month. I have no fear of her having any issues with it. She even Jill, she even had, when she was moving in, a spreadsheet of where she was going to buy different stuff to set up her apartment. You know, all these little things. You need to buy a tissue box. You need a paper towel holder, all this stuff. She sourced that and priced it all out where she was going to buy different things. She was able to do that because she made the decision to have this career. Now, back to what you said about the parents watching the kid in the basement working these, you know, 20 hour yeah. days or whatever. Yeah. She's doing that. Let's be honest. She works her tushy off. She's on vacation right now. And I think she took three hours off to go skiing. She was literally sitting at the ski lodge working on her vacation. And she works for a company that is like, oh yeah, we want to support families and, you know, take time off and depth, you know, but the kid (laughs) on her vacation, you know, she's still relatively junior. She's 25 and she and her boyfriend were sitting there. He has a similar, you know, works for the same company, similar type job. They're grinding, you know, they're working so hard for that money. And I'm just really proud of her. We'll get back to our interview with Bobby Rebel after the break. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And now the last part of our interview with Bobby Rebel. You dedicate this to your parents. So talk about how were how you raised around these issues? You know, money was something that when I was younger, they always created a feeling of security. I've only discovered in the writing of this book that there were ups and downs for sure. You know, we lived in the suburbs. My mom always wanted to live in the city, but financially we lived in the suburbs. That's where we needed to be. And I was very um, struck by my mom's limited career options. She was a teacher and teaching is a wonderful profession, but my mother was a teacher because that was really the only option. She was too short to be a stewardess. She always wanted to travel, but apparently there were height requirements at the time. And once we were in school, she went back and got a law degree, but she never got the same traction that she would have had she been in that generation, a man and been able to do it at the younger ages at that time. And that was always something that struck me as, you know, being aware of the opportunities that I have being part of. Um, I'm a Gen Xer, so being part of Gen X, we'll say. And my father, you know, he was a grinder. He, you know, he worked really hard, um, first as a lawyer and on Wall Street. And I saw him working so hard all the time, really having the stress of providing for a family, but also the benefits of success later in life as he moved into investment banking and, and was able to have much more financial freedom. That said, I think one of the challenges when you do grow up in a financially secure family is you don't always necessarily appreciate how much life will cost. And when I was looking at careers, I always wanted to be a journalist. And I had an internship at CNN in the summer before my senior year because, and let me, I backed into that the wrong way. He wanted me to work on Wall Street where he was, and I wanted to be a journalist. And so the compromise was that I got an internship at CNN Business News. So the idea for my father was, he said, okay, I'll support you. You know, you can live at home. I lived, I ended up getting a free apartment in New York City, but that's a whole other story. But, you know, I'll support you for the summer. You don't have to get a paid job, but you're going to do business news because he wanted me to have that protection that I could go and work on Wall Street if I needed to. And in the end, the compromise was business news, which frankly pays a lot more than a lot of, you know, local news or general news. And he felt I always had an exit to go work in finance because I was able to understand the markets. And even recently, and, you know, Mark will laugh at this, I was not a CFP when my first book came out, but I did become a CFP. And even then, and I think I joke about this in the book, he still asked, so are you going to go work for Goldman Sachs now? Like, what's going on? (laughs) Morgan Stanley? Like, are you finally getting a real job enough with this, like writing books and authors and being a TV anchor, like grow up already. So, you know, it's a balance. Like he's always said how proud he is of me, but I do think that he wished I had, I've done fine but I would have made more money probably had I been successful on Wall Street instead of successful in journalism. And so it's tough to watch your kids, but he has let me live my own life. And I do appreciate that. And I love him for that. 
that's very sweet. All right, before we let you go, you've got a new website. So tell us about that. What's what's going on with uh, grownupgear.com? Oh my gosh, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, grownupgear.com is my merch site. It's merch for adulting. It basically celebrates adulting. It's super fun stuff. T-shirts, sweatshirts that say things like, I can't believe I'm a grown-up either because we all are in such disbelief. And it has baby wear that's super cute, bibs, great gifts. It's basically stuff to give people during life milestones, like having a baby, getting engaged, bachelor parties, bachelorette parties, all the fun things in life that we look forward to. Happy occasions. So thank you. So grown-up gear is a lot of fun. And I've been having a great time designing stuff and the best selling stuff ironically is the baby stuff bibs mm. and onesies okay thanks so much again to bobby rebel really great to chat with her and you know listen we all have craziness with the kids with the nieces with the nephews there's a lot of helicopter snowplow parenting and you know anting and uncling that goes around. You know, Mark, it was so funny. After um, we did the interview, remember I was complaining that somebody had sent me a text about, you know, doing something. Well, then another text came in, which cracked me up. Listen to this. This is from somebody I work with. I have a favor to ask. This is a relative working on a piece about um, the importance of investing for women, blah, blah, blah. And she's asking, can you do this? And I write back, don't do her work for her. Have her reach out to me directly via email. You know, like a grown up. Just tell her to reference you. You know, it's very interesting because I haven't heard from this person yet. I haven't heard from the person herself. I just want to say again, it is incredibly important that you actually model the behavior that we want these people to have. And by the way, this person's a grown up. This is some the person who's asking is I think in his fifties and the person he's asking on behalf is in, you know, is a grown up, not a kid. But it's again, this whole idea of like, when you're asking for a favor, you're asking someone to do something like have the person do it themselves. Okay, please. All right. Let me just do a, a um, an email before we finish up this segment. This is from Marianne, who says, my financial planner is suggesting we consider a life insurance policy with a rider for long-term care. It's not for so much for insurance. It's a means to pass wealth to our children with fewer tax implications for them. My husband and I own our home. It's worth about $450,000. We have pensions. We have social security. Our 401ks are in excess of $2 million. We're 66 and 68. My understanding is that once we start this, the idea is to keep paying the premiums using post-tax money until our death, at which time our heirs will get the death benefit, maybe tax-free. Yes, the death benefit would be tax-free, but there's absolutely no reason I think you should do this. I don't know about you, Mark. I think this is a silly idea. The kids are probably, you're probably not even going to spend your $2 million and you're 66 and 68. You've got pensions. You've got social security. This seems like an extra expense that I don't understand why you would actually need it to, to assume that the kids are going to get a lot of money. And I think this is a, I don't know. I don't know who this advisor is. I'd love to hear more about you. That's all I can say, because I just don't think this is going to be really worth your while. And I think that this is one of those things where you're like, uh, you're overthinking it. Kids are going to get plenty of money. Keep your money. Don't spend your money that's already been taxed to do it. I say a big no on this particular idea. Okay. All right. Uh, let's go to a break. If you've got a question, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com. Click the contact us button and let us know what's on your mind. And also while you're there, don't forget, sign up for the free weekly newsletter. Okay. We'll be right back. K's, IRAs, refinancing, she covers it all. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. Hey, 
You're back. It's Jill on Money, and we are here to try to take the mystery out of your financial life. You know how we do that? We ask you to do something. All you need to do is go to our website. It's jillonmoney.com. And you should bookmark that website just because it's always it'll always be there for you when you're ready to go back to it. And while you're there, you can check out all the great content that is created. We do another uh, two shows, two podcasts that are called Jill on Money and I on Money. And you have links to subscribe to them right there on the website. We write a blog. There's uh, my TV appearances. Mark's got a great resources section. Everything right there for you. Most important button on the entire site is the contact us button. And that will bring you to us. That is the button that Dawn pressed when Dawn wrote this message. I am single, never been married, no kids. I'm 67 and stopped working four years ago. I will begin taking Social Security at age 70. I have a conservative and active lifestyle, playing golf, tennis, hiking, yard work, home projects. Wow, that's a lot. Um, small family, one brother, four nephews. Uh, my brother and I are savers just like our parents. Our dad lived until his late 80s. Mom is 93, still alive in pretty good health. That's great. Finances. A tiny pension, $250 a month, began at age 65 with no inflation. Social Security will be $3,300 at age 70. Interesting. Several Roth conversions before age 70. I think that's good. Living off cash reserve until I get to that Social Security magic date of age 70. Spend about three grand a month. Um, and I'm trying to learn how to spend more in retirement years. Mark, I would love to create a boot camp to help people learn how to spend more in retirement. I would love to lead that journey for many of you. Um, house owned outright, $375,000. Going to send, sell in a couple of years and move to a condo or a co-op. Switch to a new investment ter- firm two years ago. And I don't want to be on my own as I get older. That's interesting. I like that idea. First year, advisor service was great. Second year, not so good. Less attentive, disappointing. Investment models seem really good and well diversified. Cost 1% a year, asset under management. She's got a million dollars in non-retirement, 825 in retirement, 295 in Roth, 35 in an HSA. Non-retirement, 170 grand in cash, which she lives on. Questions. You ready, Mark? Does it make sense to do Roth conversions each year until I reach age 70? Yeah, why not? I would say yes. I think that getting you to the top of the 12% is just fine. I mean, she's got a lot of money that's in retirement assets, um, that 825. I guess, Mark, would you say to jump up to the 22% or not? Yeah, I think so too. I think that it may, it's not terrible. As she says, it's not like such a big deal about like leaving. She may says, I may, I may never spend the Roth account in her lifetime. She doesn't have kids. I think that you could do it. It makes financial sense, but I wouldn't go crazy either. I just do think that what's nice is that then you don't have to worry about the RMD thing. Okay. Next question. Medicare. Does it seem I will be able to avoid paying Medicare's second premium tier once those RMDs begin? Good point. So let me just say this. The Medicare, let's look at this. I have my little Medicare chart, Mark, now that I have, you have it too. The Medicare IRMA chart, filing single, the second tier is an extra 80 bucks a month. She'd have to make less than $91,000. She'd be close because of social security, right? Yeah, I think I would do, I think that's the reason to do the Roth conversions to reduce the required minimum distribution. So everyone listening, if you're not sure about this, what we're talking about is that when you start to pay for Medicare, if you have additional income, and again, the income can be created because of many different reasons, but from social security, from a pension, 
um, from doing those conversions, by the way, that can also create the income. I mean, if you're single and you make over $91,000 up to 114, you have to pay an extra 80 bucks a month of surcharges. That's not that much. So I wouldn't go crazy about it, but it's another reason to do it. And yes, you can do a qualified charitable distribution to your church or a nonprofit. You can, by the way, start doing that at age 70 and a half if you wanted to. But yes, you could do that. What do I do now or later with all the accumulated long-term capital gain? You pay for it. <laughs> How about that? Because he's got long-term capital gains. Who cares? You know, like, uh, look, you should be working with your advisor to really, like, I know you say they haven't been very uh, attentive. Then be a squeaky wheel. And if they're not attentive being a squeaky wheel, then boy, they got, you, you move the accounts. But I, I think you go to them and you say, I need to pay the tax that's due on this. It's just not that big a tax. I would get rid of the capital gains before the capital gains tax rules change on you. Yeah, you've made money and the capital gains rates are so affordable right now. I mean, for you single, the most you are going to have is 15%. That's going to be the most you pay. 15% capital gains, come on, that's a win. I think it'd be behoove you to start taking those sooner rather than later. And uh, use your advisor, say to them, hey, I need some help working through this these calculations and make them do a little work. And if they don't, then leave. There are plenty of really great advisors out there. So just leave, okay? If you've got a financial question, just go to jillonmoney.com, click the contact us button, and we would be delighted to help you out. Hey, during the break... Go to the website, jillonmoney.com, and all you need to do is bookmark it. All right, that's it. All right, we'll be right back. You're back. It's Jill on Money. And before we finish the program today, let's do one last message from one of you, our beloved listeners. This is from Susan, who writes, we're planning to retire within two years and have recently met with, she then says the name of the uh, investment group, but I don't know. I don't want to, I want to say it. We're now considering hiring them to improve our investments. I inquired what the fee would be, and it's 1%. Is that a reasonable fee on investments of seven hundred fifty to a million dollars? Well, Susan, it is certainly a reasonable fee if you're getting full time financial planning with like real planning, right? Not just money management. I've got to remind everyone that you know when you're hiring a financial advisor, they better be giving you advice because the money management end of it, man, you can get that in so many other places. You can go to Betterment. You can go to Vanguard Personal Service Advisor. You can go to Schwab Intelligent Portfolio. These are places where you can get investments for a fraction of that fee. But this is not to throw financial advisors under the bus. I think that financial advisors do a ton of good for a lot of different kinds of people. So with you, Susan, I don't know enough about your financial life to really be able to guide you. But what I can say is if you go to the website, jillonmoney.com, and you go to the resources section, we do have questions to ask before you hire a financial advisor. And if you think that you want to just run the situation by us, we're happy to talk to you about it. Okay, well, that's it. That is the program. And as always, we are so grateful that you've given us your time. We do not take that for granted. You can find all of the content that we create right on our website. You know, you've got it bookmarked by now, I'm pretty sure. JillOnMoney.com. And if you have a question, of course, you can always hit the Contact Us button. But we also have lots of other stuff there. Uh, I write a blog, and that's based on some columns that I have created. And there's TV appearances. There's podcasts. There's a lot there. So go check it out. JillOnMoney.com. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is the very best executive producer. And please try to do something nice for someone else today. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. 